नमस्कार वी आर हियर टू डे टू टॉक अबाउट द बेजिक्स ऑफ लाइट माइक्रोस्कोपी एज वी आर ऑल द स्टूडेंट्स ऑफ माइक्रोबायोलॉजी इट बिकम्स इम्पेरेटिव दैट वॉट एवर स्टडीज दैट वी कैरी आउट रिगार्डिंग द माइक्रो ऑर्गेनिजम ऑफ डिफरेंट वेराइटीज द यूज ऑफ माइक्रो माइक्रोस्कोप ऑफ डिफरेंट वेराइटीज इज नेटेड एज द स्टूडेंट्स ऑफ माइक्रोबायोलॉजी आर ऑलरेडी अवेयर the fundamental types of microscopy are the light microscopy and the electron microscopy we are today going to talk about the very basics <coughs> of light microscopy how do different types of light microscopes work what are the principles involved in the manufacture and working thereof and what are the basic techniques by means of which we get an image <coughs> where we can make a proper study of the microorganisms under study <coughs> as the first slide will show us uh we begin with the properties of light as we are all aware the light is one variety of electromagnetic radiations and the wavelength falls in the range of 400 to 700 nanometer it can also be equilibrated to 4000 to 7000 angstrom units and the waves of light the natural light consist of different waves and the basic variation among those waves falls in the wavelengths of different waves let us have a look at how exactly the light rays are propagating as i told you in the beginning light is propagating in the form of electromagnetic radiation you can see here very clearly the components two different components of the light waves the electric electric component and the magnetic component are progressing propagating perpendicular with reference to each other and that is how the light is propagating the next slide will show you how exactly the light progresses in the form of a wave and you can see the different waves of light with different wavelengths are of different color let us see that again that will make the point very clear the first at the top shows the spectrum of the light different wavelengths and then this is how the light propagates the electric component and the magnetic component <coughs> and once that happens you can see this wave progressing and progressing and progressing and depending upon the wavelength different colors of light are being formed the next slide shows us a very important property of the light with reference to the development of the microscopes when the light rays are progressing transmitting across a prism they fall into different colors the reason behind this is very simple the different wavelengths of light are bent are refracted at a different angle and the property of this is made maximum use of in the development of different types of microscopes you can see different wavelengths are propagating across the prism and their refraction angle is reasonably different we can see the same slide again look and now individual ray your screen now will flash one ray after another the first one of the light component once it hits the prism you can see it is bending to the minimum the red light and then the next and then the next and ultimately the violet one the one with the shortest wavelength and the highest frequency <coughs> this is an important property of the light rays uh the microscope as i told you in the beginning with which uh, routine laboratory work is carried out is the compound light microscope and this light microscope is illuminated with natural light or artificial light as you can see the photographs uh this one where the pointer is being placed now is the one which has been fitted with an artificial lamp and this one is an ordinary microscope with which most students are familiar is being illuminated by the natural light 
more about this will be told by Sneha. Sneha, please take over. Hello. As you can see on the screen, as have already been shown, two types of the compound light microscope. Both are used very commonly. One is using daylight as the source of illumination. And the second one is illuminated with the artificial light, which is inbuilt in the microscope. And both are used very commonly. Now, the next slide will show us the uh, basic functions. That is the compound light microscope. What are what is the construction? and how we do we get the magnification. As all of you know that the compound light microscope which is used in the routine laboratory work consists of the two lens systems. There are two lens, one is fitted in the objective and is referred to as the objective lens. The other one is the ocular lens which is fitted in the eyepiece of the microscope. Now the compound light microscope, it is very economic, easy to handle efficient and thus used popularly for routine laboratory examinations. Now let us see what are the basic functions of the microscope. So as you can see in the slide, the first function of the microscope is the magnification. We are dealing with the study of the microorganisms and all of us know that the microorganisms are invisible creatures and so to visualize them we need the help of the microscope. And so the magnification is the first important function of the microscope. You can see in the animation which is accompanying that the object which is there in the form of a small dot is not visible. But when the simple magnifying glass, as all of you must have seen and used it somewhere, that you know using magnifying glass it is very convenient to see the objects with small size because the magnifying glass would... Uh, enlarge the object and the same is carried out by the microscope where the small objects are made visible very easily and clearly with the help of the magnification power of the microscope. Now along with the magnification the second and probably the more important function of the microscope is the resolving ability of the microscope. Resolution means it is the ability of the microscope to distinguish two small very closely spaced objects like. in the form of mm. the dots or the lights uh, uh, they should be seen very clearly as the separate objects in the structure of an object and this will be very clear in the next slide where it has been shown that the objects uh, which are lying very close to each other are initially seen as the single object but with good resolution with the good uh, resolving ability of the microscope, they can be seen as the two separate objects and this is the resolution which is very important and it, uh, it, it serves the function of the resolution and by the help of the resolution it is possible to study the structural details of the object. You can see in the slide the object which is seen as the single object initially you can see now, with the magnification accompanied by the resolution, now we can see the single object as the two separate distinct objects which are lying very close to each other. So this is probably the more important function of the microscope and the magnification without resolution would be technically considered as the empty magnification and it will not make any sense. So both the magnification as well as the resolving power of the microscope are very important in the study of the microorganisms as they provide enlargement accompanied with the resolution where it is possible to have the structural details about the object. The next slide shows about the magnification, how actually it is achieved in the microscope. As it has been told that it is the uh, compound microscope, compound light microscope, it makes use of the two objective lens systems and the magnification achieved is the multiplication of the two lens systems. Here you can see in this slide that is the primary magnification. The first magnification is produced by the objective lens which remains close to the object and the second and the final magnification is produced by the ocular lens system. Now this will be very clear in the next slide where you can see the actual path of the light rays. Here you can see the light coming from the condenser lens. It passes through the object. So after passing through the object, it passes through the uh, 
uh, objective lens where the primary magnification is achieved you can see and then this is the primary magnification achieved of the object when the light rays enter the objective lens and finally they pass through the ocular lens you can see the pointer is there on the ocular lens and then the final magnification is achieved which we can see in the form of the virtual image. Now you know that the microscope which is used in the laboratory is having three different objective lenses with the different objective of uh, magnification power the low power with 10x the high power with 40x and the most commonly used lens for observing the microorganisms is the oil immersion lens where the total magnification achieved is the multiplication of the magnification obtained by the oil immersion objective multiplied by the magnification of the ocular lens so total magnification that we get is the 100x and you can see the virtual image which is uh, 100 times magnified and this is very convenient this is very helpful in observing the uh, creatures which are of very small size the microorganisms and their observation becomes very easy uh, convenient and it is accompanied by even the uh, resolution that is uh, along with the magnification we can also study the different structural details of the organisms. So, in this slide we have shown uh, the, you have been shown the complete light path and how the actually the object is magnified and we can see the final that is the virtual image of the magnified object. Now, the next slide will give you the details of the resolution, how it is actually obtained using the uh, compound light microscope and that will be discussed by Piyush. So, please take it over. As we have already seen <coughs> about four slides back, the resolution is the ability of the microscope to actually reveal the finest details of the object under observation. Putting it very simply, in scientific words, it is the ability of the microscope to distinguish between two very closely spaced dots or lines an object which is of extraordinarily small size which can never be seen by the naked eye is understood to be magnified by the microscope but equally important is the fact that it is being resolved the finer details of the structure of the object are being very clearly revealed by the microscope and this is a property of resolution as Sneha has already said it is probably probably and arguably a more important property of the microscope. So, resolution as put in the definition is the ability of microscope to distinguish between two closely spaced dots or lines. But this property of resolution is actually dependent upon a couple of different factors. It is dependent upon number one the wavelength of the light which is being employed for the illumination of the microscope or any other kind of magnetic electromagnetic radiation which will be used for the production of the magnified image of the object and it is also dependent upon the numerical aperture. As it can be seen on your screen there is a well and properly derived formula for the understanding of the resolving power of the microscope where resolving power is depicted as D and this is equal to lambda the wavelength of the light which is divided by twice the value of numerical aperture. The numerical aperture actually of a microscope is a very important property of the microscope and it once again is depending upon two different factors. The refractive index of the medium which is lying between the object and the objective. Object is always in case of the light microscope the object is always mounted on the slide which is made from glass and when the light rays are uh, developing on the object they have to pass across the condenser and then they fall upon the glass of the slide then they pass across the object and finally they move towards the objective. It is this medium between the object and the objective which in most cases when we are making use of the low power or the high power objective it is consisting of air. But as we shall be talking later on, some other type of media can also be placed between the object and the objective. So, the refractive index of this particular medium plays a very important role in deciding the numerical aperture value and thus deciding the resolving power value. 
so the numerical aperture is formulated as n sin theta where n is the refractive index of the medium which is lying between the object and the objective and theta is actually the half of the angle which is formed by the extreme rays emerging from the object and entering the objective as the next animation will tell us. You can see here, uh, this is actually, this is the objective and this is the object O, O is the object. Now it is being illuminated from bottom and when the light rays are emerging across the object, you can see this one O A, ray O A and ray O B are the rays which are considered to be the extreme rays. We call them the extreme rays because beyond O A no ray will be able to penetrate the objective and beyond O A also no ray will be able to enter the objective. So they are considered to be the extreme rays. You can see angle A O B. This is the angle which actually is depicting the cone of light which will enter the objective at a given time. So that makes angle AOB as angle twice theta. The value of angle AOB is considered twice theta and when we divide this angle into 2 by drawing a line OC, angle AOB is divided into two angles of the same value angle AOC and angle BOC and this is considered to be the theta value. Now the formula of numerical aperture as we have already seen tells us that numerical aperture is equal to n sin theta, n is the value of the refractive index and then we come to the sin theta value where sin theta as you can see here is the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse that is AC divided by AO or BC divided by BO. This gives us the idea regarding the numerical aperture. <clears throat> now this animation will tell us in better details what exactly importance the numerical aperture and the lambda, the wavelength of the light under use are holding. Let us see. You can see here, this is the low power objective in operation. Uh, what you see here is the cone of light which is entering the microscope objective and the refractive index in this case is that of air which is almost 1 because the exact value is 1.00029 refractive index of the air whereas the cover slip which has been placed above the object has the refractive index of 1.5. Now see what happens. These are the rays of light which emerge from the object and are entering the objective and this is the point where resolution is not proper because of the underdeveloped resolving power. Now you can see we have moved to the high power and now to the oil immersion lens. You see here the difference in the resolution. As we will put a drop of oil here, <coughs> concentrate upon this area, now a drop of oil will make the world of difference to the final image. A you now. The reason behind this is very simple. The refractive index of the cover slip is 1.5 and that of oil you can see is 1.45. So the number of rays which were being lost because of the excessive refraction has been minimized and therefore we get a better amount of light entering the objective and you can see as a result a well resolved image as both the wavelength and the numerical aperture values are in the favor of a better resolution. <clears throat> After having understood the basics of these uh, light microscopy, uh, the numerical aperture and resolving power, uh, let us now talk about the different varieties of the microscopy. Basically the microscope light microscope can be used in two different parameters, the bright field microscopy and the dark field microscopy. Uh, most important fact to understand before we start talking about all this is that the microscope makes use of the light. 
and invariably as I told you in the beginning the smears have to be mounted on the surface of a glass slide. Now the glass itself is transparent. The microorganisms which have to be observed are themselves transparent for the simple reason that almost 80 to 90 percent of their cell structure is made from water. Now this is a situation which is comparable to having placed a cover slip on the top of a slide. In laboratory it happens quite often that you place a cover slip on the surface of the slide and then you conveniently forget where did you place a cover slip and you won't be able to visualize a cover slip which has been placed on the slide very easily because slide is transparent even the cover slip is transparent. In a similar manner when it comes to preparing a smear of microorganisms on surface of a glass slide it is very difficult to visualize the microorganisms unless some contrast is generated. So this is a very important fragment uh, of microscopy. One has to make sure that the background and the microorganisms mounted upon that have to develop a contrast among themselves. And normally in case of the bright field microscopy, we generate the contrast by staining the microorganisms. The stains are the biologically used dyes. The dyes are the chemical substances which have the color and also have the property of imparting that color to the substrates in whose contact they come. So normally the bright field microscopy makes use of the stained preparations and these preparations are called the dried, fixed and stained smears. Under certain circumstances, of course, it is possible to visualize even the unstained preparations in the form of wet mounts, but that is not to be discussed at the moment. When we employ the bright field microscopy, we prepare a smear, we normally fix the smear by a proper technique. It could be a physical fixation technique or maybe a chemical fixation technique and then we apply the stain. By staining the bacterial cells themselves or the preparations or various structures of the bacterial cells can also be visualized very easily. As you can see there are two such preparations shown in this particular slide. Here you can see the bacilli. Uh, genus Bacillus is a very popular and very well known genus. Members of this genus are shown in this slide and the other one which I am uh, pointing at the moment shows the capsule of the bacteria. So bright field microscopy when we are making use of the fixed smears with proper staining technique can enable us to visualize the bacterial cells and also the structures of the bacterial cells. Both this is possible by the bright field microscopy. Another variation which is used very effectively using the same microscope is the dark field microscopy. In dark field microscopy we are not making use of the stains. Rather we make use or we prepare the contrast by proper manipulation of the light, the condenser, the diaphragm, these two important structures of the microscope which are playing a very important role in focusing the light upon the specimen and then transferring the light into the objective are manipulated such that a situation arises where the entire background of the microscopic field appears to be dark and the microorganisms if they are present in the field of the observation are capable of refracting a tiny amount of light which will enter the objective. Uh, we are going to observe that in the next slide how exactly does this happen. Before we move to that slide it is very important to realize that the preparation which is used for such dark field microscopic pre, uh, observation are called the wet mounts because we have to allow the microorganisms to remain capable of uh, not only remaining alive but also carrying out their normal physiological activities. Thus this technique is basically used for studying the microorganisms in living conditions. It is also used for studying the exact shape and the size of the microorganisms because the staining techniques invariably put forward some kind of distortions in the shape and size of the microorganisms. So let us see what exactly dark field microscopy is consisting of. You can see here the first animation tells us what happens during the bright field microscopy. The cone of light is entering the slide, I am sorry, is entering the objective. Now look over here 
the diaphragm has been closed and now follow the cone of light across the slide and then the light rays are progressing in such a manner that they are not capable of entering the objective. As a result of that, the background will remain completely dark unless over here an object has been placed which will refract the light in a tiny degree and you can see now the light rays are entering the objective and this is what the dark field microscopy is all about. Let us see the entire animation once again. See what happens when the diaphragm is open. The light rays across the specimen are capable of entering the objective. And now the diaphragm has been closed. Let us have a look at the slide please. Yes, diaphragm is closed. The light rays missing the objective totally. And if a transparent object in the form of microorganisms or anything else is placed in between, follow the path of light now. Yes, the light rays are entering the objectives. This is how the dark field microscopy enables us to observe the microorganisms as brightly illuminated bodies among a completely dark background. We have a film showing what exactly dark field microscopy is consisting about. Let us have a look. You can see those tiny microorganisms running around in the field. The background as you can see is totally dark. No light is otherwise allowed into the background, but the microorganisms individual cell acts as a refractive body and those very small cones of light which have traversed across the microbial cell are illuminating them and thus the microorganisms appear as tiny brightly illuminated bodies against a dark background. <coughs> In the next slide, now we are going to talk about some advanced varieties of microscopy. One is the phase contrast microscopy. Basically, the phase contrast microscopy is once again used to study the microorganisms alive and also to study the internal structures of the microorganisms. Only a little while ago, we talked that the microorganisms are transparent bodies and thus cannot be differentiated from the glass of the slide unless they are stained or the contrast is generated by any other technique. Now, microorganisms themselves contain certain structures, cellular structures which are called the organelles. These organelles are once again transparent and these transparent organelles will be very difficult to be differentiated from the transparent cytoplasm of the microorganisms. If such differences can be highlighted, then and then only the internal structures of the microbial cell can be visualized. If no, then there is no point in studying the internal structures of the microorganisms. The phase contrast microscopy actually has the capacity of highlighting those minor, almost negligible variations in the refractive indices of different components of the microorganisms which we are observing. You know that every single transparent body has capacity to refract the light rays to some degree. These small changes, see small differences in the refractive indices are so actually tiny that they are otherwise not resolvable by an ordinary light microscope. But a phase contrast microscope is much more equipped, much better equipped microscope and it enables us to observe those differences. Actually, it contains two very important components part. Number one is an annular ring and number two is a phase shifting element. These two components have capacity of manipulating the light in such a manner that when the light passes across the specimen, those negligible differences in the refractive indices of different components of the object are resolved. It is because of the fact that whenever the light traverses across an object, two different types of rays, two different types of radiations are generated. 
the diffracted rays and the refracted rays, which are also called the first order rays and the second order rays. As I told you, an ordinary light microscope will not be able to detect these differences, but because of these two important structures which a phase contrast microscope has been fitted with, the annular ring or the annular disc, which is also called the phase disc and a phase shifting element. The annular ring is placed in the connection of the condenser of the microscope and the phase shifting element is placed in the connection of the objective lens of the microscope. Let us have a look at what exactly happens when we are observing an object across a phase shifting microscope or rather phase contrast microscope. It can also be said called a phase shifting microscope. Uh, this is where a phase ring or an annular ring is fitted. This is the condenser part of the microscope and this is where the disc has been fitted. Now when the illumination takes place, you can see this ray of light passes across the phase shifting disc and reaches the objective and then look what happens. The first order ray and the second order ray, the diffracted rays and the refracted rays are differentiated very well as the light traverses across the object and across the phase shifting element. The phase shifting element here has capacity to split these rays into two different components. Let us visualize the slide again and as the slide progresses, as the entire uh, cone of light progresses, I will be talking about what happens exactly in the phase contrast microscope. Let us start again. You can see the cone of light. This is where the object is. This is where the objective lens, the light has hit the phase plate or the phase shifting element and now look what happens. The rays of light have come in contact of the specimen and all right, you can see two different components of the light. Now the most important part is to understand the difference between the first order rays and the second order rays. The second order rays have been retarded by this particular component of the light phase contrast microscope. This, the phase plate has capacity to retard the second order rays, the pink ones, by quarter of their wavelength. Up to here, the waves are progressing with the same speed, but as they will hit the phase shifting element, the second order rays will be retarded by quarter of the wavelength. Now they are falling behind, now they are lagging behind. As a result of that, the first order rays are progressing a trifle faster. This creates a difference in the phase of two rays. Now, so far they were progressing in the same phase. Now because they are passing, the, now because they are transmitting in different phases, the phenomenon known as interference will take place where the rays will cancel each other as their troughs meet each other. Because of this, the areas of continuous brightness and darkness will develop and the next slide will show us exactly how does an image develop. This is the image which develops when we observe an object under the phase contrast microscope. We can see, you can see the different cellular components very easily. They are resolved very well and like the dark field microscopy, even the phase contrast microscopy is used to study the live microorganisms, especially their physiological processes like the cell division are very well understood, very well studied when the phase contrast microscope is employed for the observation. So this is a very uh, useful technique, a uh, very uh, contributory method of microscopy as far as the understanding of the cellular physiology is concerned. One more variety is the fluorescence microscopy. The fluorescence microscopy also has made a very useful contribution in understanding of the cell structures and different components of the cell. The 
term fluorescence i believe and i very sincerely hope that should be known to the students the fluorescence is a phenomenon where a substance emits the light of higher wavelength than the one which it has absorbed this particular property will be depicted well in the next slide what exactly happens in the phenomenon of fluorescence you can see a particular radiation of light progressing and as it hits an electron the electron has been excited it has moved to the higher orbit after having stayed there for a little while it has to regain its original orbit and the energy that it releases is of higher wavelength and lesser energy level so if we look at the same slide again the blue wavelength of light comparatively more energetic has excited the electron to the higher orbit the electron stays there for a little while and as it comes back it has released the energy of less power and higher wavelength so this is the fluorescence now how this property of fluorescence has been employed in fluorescence microscopy is interesting uh, we know that the resolving power of a microscope is depending very heavily upon the wavelength of the light so we would be tempted to make use of the as small wavelength as possible but there comes a limitation that the visible light falls within the range of 400 to 700 nanometer if we make use of the light rays which are sorry radiations which are of smaller wavelength than that of light the problem remains of the image formation and visualization of image we will not be able to visualize the image which has been produced using the radiations of smaller wavelength than that of light but if we make use of the fluorescent substances then what can happen we can make use of probably ultraviolet radiations for the illumination of the microscope for the formation of the image and if the fluorescence is already employed then the image formation will be falling within the visible spectrum of the light as it has been shown here the next slide tells us exactly how it happens in case of a fluorescence microscope you can follow the path of light here the light which was produced here has gone through a filter which has allowed only the blue color light to go that has fallen upon the fluorescent material you can see the red color light is coming out there is a little trace of blue color light as well but as it goes across the half mirror which is also called the dichromatic mirror only the red light is allowed to pass let us see the same animation again very gradually so that you would be able to follow the process very well see this is where the illuminator is positioned the light multichromatic light will be eliminated will be emitted by this as it passes this only the blue color light is allowed to pass because this is a filter it goes across the mirror the half mirror then falls over the object which has been coated with a uh, fluorescent material a uh, way light of higher wavelength and different color the blue light is now transformed into red light because it has gone through the fluorescence phenomenon and the image develops that of the red color now let us have one more action replay that will tell you exactly what happens see look at the slide this is what fluorescence microscopy is all about that's it <clears throat> the next slide shows us how a particular object will appear when it has been treated with a fluorescent dye and has been observed using a fluorescent microscope fluorescence microscopy is used in different areas of studies of microorganisms sometimes it's called the diagnostic microscopy because certain pathogenic microorganisms for example mycobacterium tuberculosis is the one which causes tb in the human has a capacity of being stained with a fluorescent dye called oramin o 
the sample collected from a patient, usually the sputum sample, sputum swab is collected from a suspected patient of tuberculosis. It is treated with oramin O. What will happen if the sample contains even a single or maybe a few cells of mycobacterium tuberculosis, they will all specifically react with oramin O. The other bacterial cells will not take up oramin O, the fluorescent dye. When such a preparation is observed in the microscope, only mycobacterium tuberculosis cell which have very specifically reacted with oramino will appear of a very bright color against all those bacterial cells which have not reacted with oramino looking very pale. So, this contrast of the brightness will enable us to find out whether or not mycobacterium tuberculosis are present in the given sample. So, that is why this microscopic technique, the fluorescence microscopy is often referred to as the diagnostic microscopy. There are some more applications of fluorescence microscopy, but we will be talking about those applications in some other discussion. At the moment, now we come to the aberrations when we are making use of light microscope. Aberrations are the undesirable errors in the image formation. Whenever we make use of the microscope, we always expect it to develop a totally cent per cent perfect image of the object under observation, but there are certain limitations which fall within the laws of physics and a microscope may have several aberrations of which we are going to talk about only two, the chromatic aberration where a halo of colors appears surrounding the image produced by the light microscope. And the other one is the spherical aberration where a fuzzy image develops. We will see both these in the next slide, but before we go to that slide, it becomes necessary to clarify that apart from the chromatic aberration and spherical aberration, many other aberrations are possible to develop when we make use of the light microscope. For example, the astigmatism, the coma formation, the distortion, etcetera. We are not, as I told you, going to talk about all those. And second important uh, point that I would like to draw your attention to the, is the fact that uh, the microscope that we are using currently are all so manufactured that is abrasions are being eliminated from them. So, let us see what exactly happens in chromatic abrasion and in uh, spherical abrasion. The next slide shows us that. This requires no discussion. You would be able to see exactly what happens in chromatic aberration first. As I told you, a halo of colors develops surrounding the image. You can see it now. This is the chromatic aberration. The next is a spherical aberration. A fuzzy image develops, requires no explanation. You would be seeing it yourselves only. <clears throat> you can see now the image is becoming more and more fuzzy. So, this is the spherical aberration. <clears throat> Apart from the phase contrast microscope and fluorescence microscope, there are some more recent techniques using the light microscope that have been developed. We are simply mentioning them, we will not be talking about them in detail because of the limitation of the time, because once we get through this slide, we have to visualize a f short film about how to handle a uh, light microscope. We will be <coughs> coming to the film soon, but before we look at the film, let us have first of all a uh, glance at the improvised techniques in light microscopy. One is differential interference contrast microscopy, where the principle of handling is more or less similar to that of the phase contrast microscopy. The next one is a cone focal scanning laser microscopy, where uh, usually what we observe in a microscope is only the surface of the sample, what remains at the top of the laid down smear, but confocal scanning laser microscopy enables us to visualize uh, the different types of objects which are present 
at the depth of a mass of the sample. And then the last one is the atomic force microscopy, which is also an advanced microscopy and we have already acquired the film, so let us look at that. the microscope, one hand should be there holding the handle, whereas the second hand must be supporting the foot of the microscope. This is the right technique for handling the microscope. So whenever you are bringing the microscope to your working table, it should be handled like this. Now let us see the component parts along with the path of the light rays. This is the light compound microscope where the daylight is used as the source of light. Light rays will first fall on the mirror which is fitted at the base. This mirror is having two sides. One is concave, the other one is plane. Depending upon the requirement of light, you have to use the mirror. That is in case of full light requirement, you should be using plane side of the mirror. Whereas limited light requirement, would be fulfilled by the concave side of the mirror. So two sides of the mirror are there and one should make the use of the respective side depending upon the requirement. Now above this mirror, the condenser is present and this condenser can also be moved up and down. Once again, you can see the movement of the condenser. When it is there at down, then that is considered as the absence of the condenser. So when the light is required in limited amount, the condenser should be kept down. When it is up, it is considered to be present and so that will allow the maximum light to enter the object. Now, condenser is also having the presence of a diaphragm. You can see this is the diaphragm which can also be kept open or closed or partially open once again depending upon the requirement. When it is fully open, it will allow the full light to enter the objective lens. If it is partially open, limited light. If it is completely closed, no light will enter or very limited light will enter the objective lens. So after the condenser, you can see this is the platform of the microscope. And on this platform, we can mount the object. As you know, object is there in the microbiology laboratory in the form of the slide. So, slide can be mounted on the platform of the microscope and for the convenience, this platform is also having one extra arrangement in the form of mechanical stage. You can see, this is the mechanical stage and this mechanical stage can be moved up or down or it can be moved sideways, that is the x-axis and y-axis movement of the slide is possible with the help of this mechanical stage. And this is very helpful in observing the complete smear without disturbing the initial adjustment of the microscope. So after the mechanical stage, uh, that is the light rays, they come, they first fall on the mirror, they enter the condenser lens, then they, they, then they pass through the object and then they enter the objective lens. Here you can see there are three objectives. This is the low power objective you can see. This one is the high power objective and this is the oil emission objective and as you know the three objectives are having the three different magnification powers. Low power is having 10x magnification, high power is having 40x and the oil emission lens is having the 100x magnification. This is called the objective lens because it remains close to the object that is mounted on the microscope and that is why it is objective lens. After passing through the objective lens the light rays passes through the body tube. This portion is the body tube of the microscope. And then they enter the eyepiece lens or the ocu ocular lens. This is the eyepiece and it is fitted with the lens you can see. So this is the ocular lens and it is called so because it remains near to the eye while looking at the microscope. While looking under the microscope and that is why it is called the eyepiece lens. And the first magnification is achieved when the light rays they pass after that is they pass from the object to the objective lens and the second magnification is obtained when they finally pass through the eyepiece lens. So as it is called the compound light microscope, light is the source, compound, why it is called compound? Because the total magnification that is achieved, it is the compounding, that is the multiplication of the magnification achieved by the objective lens and that of the ocular lens and that is why it is the uh, light compound microscope by using, for example, by using the oil immersion lens which is used 
in the routine examination of the bacteria, we use oil immersion lens where the magnification power of the objective lens is 100x and that of the object eye power or the ocular lens or the eyepiece is 10x. So total magnification would be 100 into 10. So total magnification that is achieved is 1000x. So after considering the light path, now let us see how the focusing is actually done. You have to first see that all the light adjustments are proper. That is you have to see that when you are using the stained preparation of any bacteria say for example, then you should use plain mirror. You should keep the condenser up. Diaphragm should be completely open. First adjust the light using low power objective. Then you turn it to the high power. Then you turn it to the oil immersion objective. See that it remains dipped in the drop of the oil and then you lift the objective lens very slowly using these adjustments which is called the coarse adjustment or it is also referring to as the rough adjustment. So this has to be done very carefully and as soon as the object comes into the focus we have to stop and then the final adjustment is done with using the fine adjustment no. So these two knobs are for the adjustment or for the actual focusing of the object, magnified object. First initial focusing should be done using the coarse adjustment and the final adjustment should be done using the fine adjustment. So this is how actually you are supposed to operate the microscope and you should be doing function of all the component parts of a laboratory microscope. So just now you have seen in the film how the compound light microscope should be handled while observing the microorganisms. There are some small things that students usually ignore while using the microscope and among them the first one is the adjustment of light. So whenever you are uh, going to see the stained preparations, make sure that you are using the correct uh, light adjustment path that is the condenser should be up, the plain side of the mirror should be used and the diaphragm should be kept completely open. So these are the basic things that uh, all of you should follow uh, every time while using the microscope. Uh, it is our experience that generally students they ignore these types of the things and they are simply uh, interested in observing the object and many times they find problems in the observation and so I think after watching this film you will have clear idea about how the uh, microscopic observations and the use of the microscope should be made in the laboratory. The next slide is about the references that we have made while preparing these uh, basics of the light microscopy, this material, the textbooks that we have referred to have been mentioned in the slide. We have also made use of the websites for preparing the animations. So that has also been acknowledged. And before we conclude, a big thanks to all of you students and teachers who have been watching this and our most sincere and heartfelt thanks to Commissioner at Higher Education Gujarat State and also to the director and staff members of BISEG who have always been extremely cooperative and this presentation otherwise without their help would not